Okay, so let's continue with our second half where we are going to see what we can do when the pure object oriented approach doesn't quite work. And remember, we had this problem with schema evolution that we deleted some data members, but we still want to access the data in our data migration function. The data is still in the database because we, are, we haven't dropped the columns yet. So how can, we, how can we solve that? Any ideas, any suggestions? How about stashing old versions of our uh, classes into some version namespaces? Any, anyone likes this idea? Yeah, it's too much, you know, luggage or someone, some might call it garbage to carry around with your application. Well, the ODB solves this a bit differently, and the idea is to support soft model changes. Let's start with soft delete. Essentially, the idea is instead of physically removing data members from our classes, we mark them as deleted at a specific version. Once the member is deleted, ODB st stops treating it as persistent starting from that version, it still, it still loads it in the, between the pre and post migration steps, but once the columns are dropped and the schema is really version three, then those members are treated as transient. In other words, they, they are no longer stored or loaded from the database. So in our case, all we have to do really is to say that, keep the data members and say that they are deleted at version number three. And once we do that, this just works. No change is necessary. Now, the problem with this approach is that we now have, you know, data members that are not really used. Well, they are used during data migration, but during the normal application runs, when we working with a current schema version, those data members are just taking up memory in the class. So the way we can uh, rectify this a bit is by moving all of them into a, a composite value type and then using uh, something like unique pointer for this composite value. The idea is that during data migration, ODB will automatically instantiate, create an instance, allocate a dynamic instance for this um, value type and load the data members. But during the normal run of our application, when we are dealing with a current schema version, this pointer will remain null. So the end result is that you get a single pointer over here for all your deleted data members, which I think is not bad when the alternative is something like that. Okay, so we also, besides the soft, soft delete is kind of intuitive, right? But we also need soft add, anyone can think why we would want something like that? Well, this is, sorry? Yeah, but you, we've, we've added it and off we go. Why do we, why do we need to say that it's added softly? The answer is reverting the database. Maybe I haven't thought about that. But this is, this is another example. I think the overall theme that I'm trying to also highlight here is that this schema evolution stuff is a really complex and difficult thing and, and very unintuitive. Okay, remember version two, where we added the platform uh, column. So you see, the problem is not even in, in, in the version that we are currently considering. It's actually in the previous <laughs> version. So this is the data migration function that we saw. Remember, we loaded all the bugs, and then we set the platform to unknown, and then we updated the bug. So 
which version of the database this code runs on? Anyone, any idea? Okay. So in reality, it's actually somewhere between version one and two, right? We already executed the pre-migration steps, so we added the new column, but it's not really a final version two, so it's somewhere in the flux, but it's definitely not version three, right? So in fact, when we wrote this code, we didn't even know anything about version three. We had no idea what kind of changes we might do during version, in version three, or if there will be version three at all. So the problem will be when we call this update function. And the reason for that is that we now have a data member, a new data member in our class called name, but the column for this data member will only be added in when we migrate to version three. In version two, we didn't, there's no column for name. We never even knew that there will be a column for name. So remember, this is kind of tricky part. So now we've added this name, member, and ODB now thinks that it was there all the time, but in reality it only, we only added it in version three. So when we call update, the statement that is executed in, underneath it will also try to update the name, but during, in, in version two of our database there is no column called name. We only added it in version three. So this is the reason why we need soft add. So the, 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 the logic is symmetrical to soft delete, but soft add, we only get, the, the, the data member is only treated as persistent starting from that version. So once we mark it as added, it will no longer, because this code runs on version one or between version one and two of the database, it will not be treated as persistent. This is one thing that kind of one needs to keep in mind when writing data migration code. Our main application logic runs with the current database version, but the data migration code can run several versions behind the current version. So we need to be careful not to change our object model in such a way that it breaks the data migration code that we've written before. Luckily, in most cases, you will get, um, well, in, yeah, in most cases, you'll get a, a compile error, like for example, for deletion. But for addition, unfortunately, that will only be a runtime error when we actually try to call the update. Okay. So this is how far, this is as far as I'm gonna take it with schema evolution, but the topic is, is quite complex and in the documentation there is a pretty big chapter on, on that. So we, we haven't even touched on issues, for example, such as you know immediate versus gradual schema migration. All, all our examples for immediate migration, which is quite simple. We basically load everything and, and migrate it right away. But imagine we had a couple of million bug, bugs in our database. It might take several days to migrate. So instead of doing that, we can implement uh, a gradual migration. For example, we only migrate the data when the bug is updated for some other reason. So the database will be slowly updated as the application runs. And then we can, at, after, after the bulk of the bugs, for example, have been migrated like that, we can execute an immediate migration that will kind of finish off the migration. So there is a lot of interesting issues and problems. But yeah, the, the overall idea is to keep it as simple as possible. So it's easy to understand. Okay, let's now talk about uh, cases where things don't quite map one-to-one -one between ORM and database operations and where we can find some surprises. And let's start with containers. So remember, this is our bug class after we've added the list of comments to it. So we've seen that before, we added the vector. Let's take a look at this simple transaction, right? We load a bug report and we add a comment to it. A typical one that you would see on many bug reports. And then we update it. If we enable statement tracing for this transaction, 
we'll see a surprisingly large number of database statements executed underneath. And the reason for that is that standard vector doesn't contain any change in formation. In, in our case, we've just added one comment at the back, but we could have overwritten the vector completely and there's no way to tell the difference. So as a result, ODB has to assume the worst case scenario and transfer the complete container state to the database. So what will ODB do is delete all the entries in the database and then transfer all of them back in, which is not very efficient to say the least. And uh, ODB way to address this is to use change tracking containers. The idea is that ODB provides change tracking containers for uh, a couple of standard containers. And these containers, besides storing the elements, just like ordinary ones, they also st store the change information. Based on, on this information, ODB can then um, execute the minimum number of database statements in order to synchronize the container state with the database state. Currently, ODB provides uh, change tracking equivalents for standard vector and uh, queued list. Both of them impose a two bit overhead per element. So this, there are two bits used to store the change, st change state. So to address our problem, all we have to do is basically replace STD with ODB. Let's now take a look at the relationships. Who thought that it was too good of a story, you know, that we just add a couple of pointers and maybe use a weak pointer in certain places and it just works? Anyone thought it was too simple to be true? Well, it was a um, couple of issues here as well, especially uh, 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 unidirectional relationships are work fairly all right. Bidirectional relationships, things get a bit complicated. Okay, let's take a look at this transaction. Here we load the user. Remember our user has a list of, of bugs that it, he or she reported, and then each bug contains and a pointer back to the user that reported it. So let's see what happens here. So the ODB loads the user object. The user object contains the list of bugs that this user reported. So ODB has to load the bugs as well. So it loads all those bug objects that the user reported. But then the bug objects, they have a pointer back to the reporter. Fortunately, ODB has no way to know that it, it, it needs to patch that pointer back to the user object that it just loaded. So it will keep going and loading the user, the same user object again. And then once it loads the user object, it loads, it sees the reported bugs and it has to go, go load the bugs again. So in the end, you will end up with a, a recursive calling of load of bugs and, and users, bugs and users. Well, in reality, it's a little bit better. In most cases, DB will detect that you are doing this and it will throw an exception, which will tell you that you need a session. A session is essentially an object cache. It's a lightweight. The default implementation is a lightweight object cache, single threaded. And the idea is that ODB will now be able to, once it loads the first user object, it, it will store it in the cache. And when it needs, to load the subsequent user object for the, for the bugs that were reported, it will actually see that it's already loaded because it's already in the cache and it will just patch the point back to that object. So session is, a, is necessary if you want to load the bidirectional relationships. Um, now I said the default implementation is just an object cache. In ODB, a, you, know, you can customize a se session. You can provide your own session which can provide uh, far more advanced functionality. For example, this, um, in one of the examples, you can see how to implement a session that, imp that does, uh, that, that tracks changes in objects and then automatically flushes the, their state when you call commit. So that's something like, for example, Hibernate in Java does. So you can implement that in C++ as well.
Okay, so that's one problem, which is not too difficult to address. Luckily, there's another problem. Let's say all we want to do in this transaction is to print the user's name. So what will happen is we load the user object, we all the bugs are loaded, let's say there were a couple of hundred of them, then we print the username and we you know, deallocate all those objects, all those bug objects without ever touching them. So this is wasteful. And this is another example of, of a situation where a, a simple call like that can actually result in quite a few database operations underneath. And the ODB answer to that is lazy pointers. Lazy pointers provide fine-grained uh, control over relationship loading. The idea is that by default, the lazy pointer is in unloaded state. So we just get the object ID, but don't actually execute a database um, statement to load its state. And we can later decide if and when it's necessary for us to load the object. For every smart pointer that I mentioned earlier, ODB provides a corresponding lazy version. And you can also implement your own lazy version for your own smart pointer. So here's how we can fix this, our problem. We can, instead of using a standard weak pointer, we use ODB lazy weak pointer. There's the standard uh, weak pointer interface, plus a couple of extra functions that allow us to check whether the pointer is loaded or unloaded, as well as loaded. So in case of a weak pointer, loader actually does both load and lock, which makes sense if you think about it. Who can tell me why don't we use change tracking vector here? Now, this is a tricky question. Okay, so the answer was, uh, can, can you repeat, I'm not sure. So the answer was that a change tracking vector would, would keep track whether the point is loaded or unloaded. Um, no, I don't think that will happen because the load state is actually transient. So it's kind of an application memory. Well, the answer is, is like, this is actually, there's nothing stored in the database for this thing. Remember, it's an inverse side of a relationship. The only thing is what's stored is in the, in the bug, the reporter entry. This is just basically a, a result of a SQL select query. There's nothing in the database for it. So that's kind of an interesting side effect of, a, of having an inverse side of a relationship. Remember, we talked about that in, in C++, if you want to have Two classes relate to each other, you add a pointer into each one of them. But in the database, if you want to have two tables related, you only need to add something to one table. You can traverse it in both ways. So this is the side where there's nothing in the table. So as a result, there's no need to track changes of, of something that is not stored in the database. Okay, so so lazy pointers allow us not to load objects or to load them even when necessary or some of them. Kind of the natural, next natural thing to ask is why can't we do it for other data members, right? There might be some big objects that we might not always want. For example, in our bug report, we have a description, which can be quite big, right? And we have also can a list of comments, which can contain quite a few of them. So in ODB, we can actually implement lazy loading for any data members and the way we do it with object sections. A section is essentially allows you to partition all the data members in your persistent class into a separately 
loadable and separately updatable sections. So there are two kind of sides of it. The loading strategy, which can be ego or lazy. Uh, an ego loaded section is loaded as part of the object load, while the lazy section is similar to the lazy point in that we have to explicitly load it when we, when we need to or if we need to. Update can be, the update strategy can be always change in manual, always again it's updated as part of the object update. Change is updated as part of the object update but only if we mark the section as changed. And finally manual is similar to load, load la uh, lazy loading, excuse me, in that we have to do it explicitly ourselves if and when necessary. Sections are fairly lightweight. They impose a one byte overhead for each section in the object. So let's take a look how we can do that. So the first thing is we add the data member of the ODB section type. This uh, data member will take one byte. Then we specify this loading and update strategy. We say it's going to be lazy loaded and updated only if we marked it on if we marked it as changed. Then we specify which data members actually belong to this section. Okay. So once we do that, we can implement something like this. So this is a transaction that checks all the open bug reports and if they look interesting then we say okay I'm working on them and update it, update them. So if the bug looks interesting then we need to load the section. The load call is very similar to the database to the object load except that now we also have to specify the sections so basically we say load this section in this object then we add a comment and we mark the section as changed. Because we did that, this update later on, we'll see, okay, this section was changed. So the data members that belong to this section has to be, have to be updated as well. Now, normally this too will be done automatically by a modifier. We probably wouldn't access data members directly. So all this section business is normally hidden from the users of your class to a certain extent. Okay, another trick one, tricky question. So here we have a, a, a lazy loaded section and we of, of lazy pointers. Does that make any sense? Well, this actually makes quite a bit of sense. In, a se in essence, we have two level laziness. When we load the object, this vector is empty. So we haven't loaded the IDs of the, of the related objects. Once we load the section, this vector is essentially contained now is loaded with object IDs. An unloaded lazy pointer is essentially a, stores an object ID. So that's the first level. And once we want to load certain or all of the objects, then we have to load the corresponding lazy pointers. So in a sense, the first step is load object pointers, and the second level is load actual objects. So this is actually, while it might look strange, it actually makes perfect sense. Okay, so object sections allow us to, you know, to not load certain parts of the object, but they, they are still not ideal in, in certain cases. We still cannot achieve you know, an optimal result that we would get, for example, if we use the SQL API directly. As an example, consider this transaction. Here we want to print a summary of all our open bugs. For example, if a user gets onto the front page of your bug tracker, that's what he or she might see. You know, a bug ID, a summary, and who reported it. There are two problems with this. Even though we are using sections, we will still load some unnecessary data members. 
a, a bigger issue is that we actually we, we have to execute a separate statement, a database statement to load each user, each reporter. It would have been, if we were writing this in native SQL, we would do it in a single statement by joining the two tables together and only get the data members that we're actually interested in. You can do that in ODB without actually degenerating to native SQL. And the way to do it is by using views. ODB views are a lightweight, read-only, projection of one or more objects, database tables, some combination of the two, or at the lowest level, views can be used to handle the result of a arbitrary SQL query execution, so some, some native query that you want, such as aggregate queries, stored procedure calls, things like that. Okay, let's take a look how we can we're going to look at some of the examples of this. And we'll start by trying to fix our transaction. So we want to essentially achieve the efficiency that we would get if we were writing manual SQL. So a view is a structure or class, some data members. So the idea is that we will extract the data from a query into the view. So we specify that it's a view, not an object or a value. And then in this case, we say this view is, is based on, on the bug object and the user object. And then we list the data members that we want, that we are interested in. Now you might notice that the names of these data members are very similar to the ones in our persistent classes. And this is not an, an accident. That, if, if, if the data members are quite close to, in names, like for example, in our persistent classes, with, we have underscores, but here we don't, ODB compiler will, will figure this out. So the, the idea is to name them similarly, and then we don't need to do anything else. ODB compiler will figure out which data member comes from where. But if you don't like this, if you, for example, want to change names, then you can always specify which, you know, the data member correspondence. Some of you might wonder how, how does ODB know how to join these two tables underneath in a query. And ODB uses object relationships to join the tables. In, if, if there's only one, then we don't even have to specify which one. ODB will figure that out automatically. But if there were several relationships between our bug and user for some reason, then we, instead of, you know, with a join, you have to spell out the, the exact condition, you know, the comparison between object IDs. With ODB, you can just specify, use this relationship, and that's it. So th this is kind of the overall theme of that. It's not exactly pure object-oriented, but it's, it's still, you know, we're still dealing with objects, and this is a, a projection of these two objects to, into some other class. Okay, let's take a look how we can use this view to fix our transaction. So now in, we, instead of querying for a for a bug for bugs, we are querying the database for this view. And as you can see, we still have access to the data members, you know, we, can, we can use, we can construct a query condition using data members in the associated objects. And if we look at the SQL select statement, then you can see it's a single statement, joins the two tables and extracts only the data members that we, that we want. So this is basically a, a select statement that one would write by hand. Let's take a look at the aggregate view, um, a, a view that, that runs an aggregate query. Again, we associate the, the bug object. We want to count the number of bugs that match a certain criteria, for example, open or closed, 
So the only thing is interesting here is this curiously looking mixture of, of native SQL and C++. Well, the, the idea is that you, you specify the function as a native SQL name. So hopefully we can spell this one right. And then instead of specifying a column as, as a string as well, which is easy to mix, misspell, we just specify a, a data member in the bug class and ODB will automatically put the column name in there. So once we have that, we just run the query. We know that the result of this query is always a single element. So we kind of shortcut this whole iteration thing. So here's how we can count the number of closed bugs in our database. Okay. A little bit more interesting example of an aggregate query. Here we want to count the number of bugs um, matching a certain criteria for each user. So we use the group by. Again, the only interesting part here is the query template. You can see we are using this question mark placeholder. This is where the, the, run, the condition that we specified in, at runtime is placed. So we add a group by close, again, a piece of native SQL, and then we specify the data member name, which will be translated to the column name. And this is how we can query for all the, well, count the number of open bugs for users with the last name though. And here you can see we also, it'd be nice to know the name of a user for which we counted the bugs. So we extract this information here as well. You can use views to call stored procedures. This is an example for SQL Server. That's how we can use it. Again, here we are passing two arguments and we assume that it returns uh, two columns, some ID and some result of the analysis. The lowest level kind of view is a native view where when we declare it, we just say it's a view, essentially. You know, it's, it's a result of some query execution. And we, we provide the actual query at runtime. So this is an example of completely custom um, select statement that is used to return a next value of some sequence, for example, in Postgres. So the idea of views to summarize that at the highest level, you still deal work in terms of objects. And you can kind of go down all the way to a native, view, a native select statement or a procedure call like that. Okay, let's talk a bit about concurrency. Um, let's say we want to implement a transaction that shows the, the current bug status to the user and then ask the user to enter a new status, and then we update the status in the database. We do it all in a single transaction, which is nice and simple in the sense that, you know, nobody is going to change the bug underneath us while the user is thinking. And also, more importantly, we are not gonna override someone else's changes. So that's, that's kind of the benefit of a transaction. But there are also drawbacks to doing this in a, in a single transaction. Imagine what happens if the user goes to grab a cup of coffee while contemplating the new, bag, the new bug. During this time, we have an active transaction which consumes database services, uh, server resources, which is quite expensive. And in generally in a high concurrency environment, you know, when we have multiple transactions running at the same time, doing that, we want to keep the transactions nice and short and doing any kind of user input during a, in a transaction is definitely a bad idea. So how can we fix this? Well, the natural thing to do is to split it in, into two transactions, right? To do the user input outside of a transaction. So here's what we did. We, the first transaction loads the bug, then we show the user the status and ask for a new one. 
And then once the user entered the new status, we start another transaction and update the bug report. Well, while we fixed what was wrong with our previous <coughs> approach, we also broke what was good. And that is now someone can change the, the bug report while the user is thinking because it's no longer within a transaction. And we can override someone else's changes based on this outdated information. This is actually a fairly common problem in, in the database world. And you know, lo long-lived application transactions that might, might involve user input. And the solution for, the, for this problem is actually fairly simple and elegant. It doesn't happen very often. And it's called optimistic concurrency. The idea in a nutshell is to hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst or more specifically, hope that nobody is actually going to change the object underneath us, but also be able to detect if that happens and, and to recover. ODB uses object versioning to implement optimistic concurrency. It's probably the most common approach. The idea in a nutshell is that when ODB updates an object state in the database, it first checks the version of the object. If it matches that to what, what's in the application memory, then that means that the object hasn't been changed by someone else and the update succeeds. But if the versions don't match, then the update fails and the application has to recover. Because um, a recovery from a failed transaction can be fairly expensive, as we, as we will see in a moment, optimistic concurrency works best for medium to low contention levels. So in other words, you don't want to use this if you know, the same object is updated by multiple you know, processes or threads in your database constantly, because then you will have a lot of failed updates. Okay, let's take a look how we can use this with ODB. First step is to say that the object uses optimistic concurrency. We just at this optimistic um, fragma. We also need to add the object version so and, and say that it is an object version. We don't need to actually do anything with this data member. ODB manages it completely automatically. We can use it for debugging or tracing. It can be useful to see how the state of an object, how the version of an object changes, especially if things don't work out the way you hoped that they would. Okay, let's now take a look how we can fix our transaction using this optimistic concurrency approach. The first half is exactly the same, that is we loaded the bug report and now we use what I call a recovery loop. So we show the user the current status as before and ask him to enter the new status. Once it's entered, we start the transaction and we try to update. If nobody changed the object while the user was thinking, then the versions in the database and in, our, in the application memory will match. The update will succeed and we are done. However, if the object was changed by someone else, then this update will fail with the object changed exception, in which case, we reload the state and we continue from the beginning. We show the user the new status, ask him to enter, and so on. So when I said that it can be expensive, you can see what happens here. If the object changed, we have to reload its state from the database and kind of start the whole work that we've done from scratch. So you don't want this to happen too often. Okay, someone asked about inheritance, so that's the part about that. Sooner or later we'll want to use uh, to store a polymorphic class hierarchy in the database. Let's say in our bug tracker we actually have two kinds of bugs, bugs proper and feature requests. Most of the fields for the two are common. For example, both of them have status, summary, and description. But there are also some fields that are specific to either bugs or features. For example, for, for bugs, we have a platform. And for features, we have a number of votes that people cast for it. 
I think fairly typical design. I think most of you recognize it. So how, how can we... Well, ODB can store this for you, but I, I think the most interesting question is how is it mapped in the database? And there are actually several options to do that. ODB uses the so-called uh, table per difference mapping. So this is the database schema that will, will be generated for, the, for this class hierarchy. It looks a bit thick, but don't worry. It's actually pretty simple. Here are the actual data members that are for, for each class. As you can see, the issue table stores the common data members, while the, each of the concrete class tables store the unique the members that are only in each class. The tables are linked using the object ID. And we also have this type ID implicit member, which is the dynamic type of the object stored. So this is the mapping used by ODB. The uh, nice thing about this approach is that it's very um, extensible. You can add additional derived classes and you don't have to change any, any other tables or any other classes. Okay, so to enable um, polymorphic class hierarchy in ODB, we mark the base class as polymorphic. It also has to be polymorphic in the C++ sense, in meaning that it has to declare one or more virtual functions. Having a virtual destruct is generally a good idea. You don't need to do anything special for derived classes. They automatically treat it as poly polymorphic because the base is polymorphic. Now the interesting part starts when we actually try to persist or, you know, run a database operation on a polymorphic instance and we pass a base interface. In this case, ODB will actually store the actual dynamic type in the database. So for example, here we have an issue, which is actually a bug. And we, if we call persist, the ODB will persist the bug. And call update, I will update the bug or reload the bug. The more interesting part is when uh, the database operation actually returns an object to us. So here, here we are loading an issue given its ID, and the result is actually either a bug or a feature you know, that we can, for example, call a virtual function on. The same for queries. If we query for an issue, we, we get a mixture of bugs and features. So here we, get, we are getting a, all the open bugs or all the open features. Uh, the query case is actually quite interesting in that by specify th this type that we specify, what we, which type we are querying, with the type of an object that we are querying for, it actually becomes, in a sense, part of the query condition. For example, if we query for all the open issues, we get both bugs and features. If we query for bugs, we only get open bugs. And if we query for features, we only get open features. This is kind of quite a nice and natural interface. Okay, bulk operations. I don't know if anyone here familiar with bulk operations. You know, should I skip it maybe? Okay, let me quickly run over it. The idea is that, let's say we want to persist a million objects in the database. Sounds crazy, but some scientific applications require that actually. And if we execute a single persist, which translates to a single pers uh, insert statement underneath, that can take very, very long time for various reasons. And the way some databases address this is by allowing you to kind of persist, to, to essentially execute an insert statement for a whole bunch of, of, of data rows. So you essentially say, execute this insert statement, and here's the data. And it's like multiple objects or multiple rows. And this is a lot faster than doing a single insert. So this feature is actually still work, work in progress and will be available in the next version of ODB, but it's quite far along, so I'm comfortable showing some interfaces. So we have a persist update and erase overloads that have a 
I think, fairly familiar interface, right? We have a pair of iterators that identify a range, similar to what you would find in a vector insert and some, some such. So the idea is that for databases that support this, ODB will use the bulk operations instead of you know, executing a single statement underneath. So we can also, you know, if we want to persist, say, a million objects, a database will, won't allow you to persist a million at a time. Normally there is a smaller, what the so-called batch size, that is optimal for, for, for inserting at once. So we can specify the batch size and also specify that this class should support bulk operations. I didn't say, uh, show you, but in ODB you can prefix a pra any pragma with a database name and it will only apply to that database. So here we say, you know, make a batch for Oracle 5000 and for Microsoft SQL 7000. Once we do that, so basically ODB will you know, batch that million of inserts into these chunks. One interesting problem that these bulk operations present is how do you report errors? Both Oracle and SQL Server, they have this interesting semantics in that they will keep inserting subsequent rows in a batch, even if the previous ones fail for some reason. So in the end, you kind of have a batch, some rows failed, some rows succeeded, and the reasons for different rows, while they failed, it can, it can be different, you know, some key conflict or anything. So how do, how do you report it back to the user? When we had a single persist, we just throw an exception and it's nice and clean. You cannot m throw multiple exceptions in C++ at the same time, not yet, maybe in C++ 2020, who knows. Um, so what we did in ODB is to have this curiously named exception called multiple exceptions, which is essentially that, it carries multiple exceptions. And when we handle it, we can end up with this strange looking catch block. So essentially we iterate over exceptions and it, it contains the position in the, in the range that we passed, and as well as the actual exception that caused this to fail. So we can do something like that. Okay. I don't know, it, I think my time is out, so I still have a couple of slides more. I don't know if you want to continue. Or... Yeah, continue, cool. So, I, I'm sure all of, all of you are familiar with the pimple idiom, right? We hide all the data members in the source code for various reasons. So now we don't have a data members, so how, how does, how can we map, how, how can we persist this with ODB? Because now ODB doesn't see data members, so there's no way to derive columns and so on. Well, we normally will, would have accesses and modifiers for the data members, right? If you think about it, it's not really, for, for DB, it's not really necessary to have a physical data member in a class, right? All ODB needs is some name to derive the column from, right? The type of the data member, so it knows how to map it to the database, as well as a access and a modifier so that it, it knows how to read and write in the generated code. So there's actually no reason to have a, a real physical C++ data member. And ODB actually supports that, exactly that, with what we call virtual data members. Let's see how we can use them to sort out our pimple class. Specify the name. Specify the type. Now this name is actually used for two things. First, it derives the column name for this data member, but it also used by ODB to automatically figure out which accesses and modifiers to use. See, we have named it ID here, and now accesses and modifiers also called ID. ODB will see, okay, this is the function, const function returns my type, cool. That's the accessor. <coughs> 
Okay, this is non-const function takes a single over argument of my type. Cool, this is the modifier. I mean, you can also, also specify the accesses and modifiers explicitly if you want to, but this is a nice and clean way to do it. Then we have the summary, exactly the same idea. That's how you handle the pimple idea. We also have to mark this uh, actual point as transient so that ODB doesn't try to persist that because that, that's not going to help us in any way. Let me also show you a bit more complex and advanced example of accesses and modifiers. In fact, it doesn't have to be a function. It can be an expression or even a, a series of statements. So as an example, let's say we have this name composite value type, right? We have first, last name, but for some reason, who knows why, in, in our user class, so we have a data member called name, but for some strange reason, we decided to unpack it in the accesses and modifiers. So we have first, last functions and first, last modifiers instead of, you know, passing name back and forth. Strange decision, but happens. So how can we handle that? So we can do it by specifying an accessor and modifier expressions. This looks a bit hairy, but actually not that difficult. So let's start with the accessor expression. So in the accessor, ODB expects us to return this name type, but we need to source it from this unpacked accessors and modifiers. So what we do, we just construct a temporary name. This, this placeholder, is, the, is, is a placeholder for a const reference to the object. So in the, in the generated code, it will be re replaced with the right thing. So what we do here is construct the name, get, and we do it by get, calling the first accessor and the last accessor on the object. Pretty simple. So this is an example of an accessor expression. Modify is a bit more interesting. So here we, we need to do the reverse. Uh, ODB extracted the name from the database and as name, and now we need to unpack it into two modifier calls. So that's what we do. This, in this case, is non-const reference to the object. And then we have this question mark placeholder, which is replaced in the generated code with a, with a variable for the name that the ODB extracted for us. So this, this is actually two statements, so it's an, a little code fragment. Oops, forgot the column here. Semicolon. Okay. Couple of more slides. Index definitions. You can do it in the SQL, you know, write your in index definitions in the SQL, but it's often much easier to do it in RDB. Couple of special pragmas for it. If it's a single state member index and we don't be happy with ODB deriving the name automatically, then we just specify, you know, it's an index or we can specify it's unique, use unique instead of index. If you want something more um, complex, then you have this index definition pragma where we specify the index name, we say that it's a unique index and we have some database specific method and it's also based on two data members. So you can do all that. Pretty much you can define any index like that you, instead of using SQL. Prepared and cached queries. Okay, just a single slide. The idea is that when you execute a query, it, it's, it's prepared, executed, and then destroyed, which would be use, uh, wasteful and useless if we want to execute the same query multiple times. So in this case, we can prepare one. And not shown on this slide, you can even cache it on a connection. So there's actually a little storage facility in the connection where you can put your prepared queries in and then look them up later. But yeah, the idea is that we create the query condition as before. It makes sense to use by reference parameter bindings so we can run the query with different arguments. Then we call prepare query, get the prepared query 
as a return. And then we can call it multiple times, initializing the by reference parameter to different values. Okay. Other features that I haven't covered, let me just mention a sentence for each. They are extended database types. Uh, we all know they are blobs and strings and integers, but most databases actually go far beyond that, Postgres being a, a really um, good example. They are uh, geospatial types, they are XML, there's hash tables, Postgres has containers, so it's, it's actually quite a zoo there. So for ODB, you can actually map any C++ type to any of that of those extended database types. There is a mechanism for that, fairly generic. Then you can use uh, class template instanti instantiations to define your objects, views, or composite value types. Uh, support for on-delete. Uh, deleting object re um, relationships are quite tricky when it comes to you know, deleting state from the database. So one of the ways to do that is to say, you know, automatically delete all the related objects or set their pointers to null. This is kind of mapped to the on delete clause in the database. Those are familiar. Connection management. ODB has a fairly flexible connection management approach in that you can provide your own strategies. By default, uh, ODB uses connection pool, but you know you can either base it, base your implementation on one of the existing connection factory so you can write your own completely from scratch. So there's quite a bit of customizability. Callbacks. You can re you can have a your own function called before and after each database operation for any any object. So you specify a callback for an object. Then there's also transaction callbacks. You can be called when transaction rollbacks or or commits, and there's support for things like recoverable exceptions, such as deadlocks, timeouts, or connections dropped. So you don't need to kind of dig through um, error codes, database-specific error codes. It's all nicely detected and mapped for you. Customizations. I think you, you've seen the overall theme is that anything ODB has built-in support you can take your own thing and, and provide support that will look exactly as, the, as what ODB does. So in particular, you can map any C++ type to a database type. For example, if you have your own string, you can map it to a database string and it will behave just like a std string. You can use custom containers, including change tracking containers. You can implement your own version of a change tracking container custom smart pointers, custom null wrappers. You know, if you use something better than boost optional, you can map it to a null, nullable column. Custom sessions, as I mentioned, can provide quite advanced functionality. And you can package it all into a custom profile. For example, if your company, you know, have your own internal containers and smart pointers and whatnot, you can create a little profile library and then the users within your company can just you know use the all those data members all those types as data members without any further knowledge about ODB in the for the future one thing that we've been asked a lot about is to automatically generate the classes from the tables definition some people have a couple of thousand of those so writing classes by hand doesn't seem appealing to them so this this will probably be the next major feature but it, it's quite quite a complete tricky and complex problem because the mapping is not always clear like how do you map containers and things like that then it would be nice to be able to use containers in queries that's also something that we ask a lot so we need to support that and then mass update. I think someone pointed out about, you know, during data migration, we could just, you know, instead of loading the objects into the application memory, doing some changes and storing them back to the database, we can actually 
run and update that changes everything on the database side. Maybe in the future, who knows, haven't been decided for sure. So we can conceivably support persistence to something like XML and JSON instead of a relational database. That will probably be fairly straightforward to implement. Then there are some document databases that seem like natural choice for storing object-oriented models such as MongoDB and RethinkDB, also something that might be interesting to look in, into. And then there's sharding, which we could probably do something as well. Okay, if you want to give it a try, there's the home page and the manual. It's quite big, it's about 400 pages and goes into some excruciating details on all that I've covered. <laughs> here and there's my blog that I don't really have time to update much. And that's it. Thank you very much for sticking it out. I don't know if there are any questions. Sorry, can you repeat that? Mm. Okay, so the question is, when I showed you the bulk operation support, why is the batch size specified on the object and not on the database? Because as we can see, it's database specific. And that's actually a good question. And the answer is, ideally, you would want to, you see, you want, you want to be able to specify different batch size for different objects because, you know, it might perform better. And ideally what you would want to do is to actually be able to specify it on a connection basis, not even a database basis. So there's kind of a hierarchy going down. But the reason we've decided to do this is there are two reasons. First of all, this is the simplest. I mean, this stuff is already insanely complex if you look at the code. I mean, it's, it, it, once you see how it's implemented in, in, for each database API, like for Oracle or SQL Server, it's very, quite complicated. That's one reason. And the second reason is specifying it at compile time actually gives some advantages in the sense that we can allocate stuff statically. For example, there's, there's now there's going to be a buffer for, you know, now we have a buffer for all data members. When, when, the, when the class is not, does not support bulk operations, so there's a single, um, you know, struct with all the data members, simplifying things a bit. But now we need an array of those structs because you remember, we, we basically what, at the API level we say, Okay, here's the array of all the data, and here's the statement executed on all those elements of an array. So what we can do now, when we have this knowledge at compile time, we can allocate this array statically. You know, we don't need to do new, we just have it as a data member with a fixed array size. So th this actually results in few allocations and you know, cleaner code, so basically a lot of by knowing this bulk batch size at compile time allows us to basically simplify code and optimize it much better. But yeah, that's a good, that's what, that was a good question. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, one more. Bulk operations. I would say a couple of months, so not too. I mean, they, they are pretty much done. Uh, there's just a couple of kind of finishing touches to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.